infectious diseases, research, medicine, health. Welcome to Outbreak News Interviews. And now, broadcasting from the Outbreak News Skylar Studios in beautiful West Central Florida, here is your host, microbiologist and editor of OutbreakNewsToday.com, Robert Harriman. Well, hey everybody, this is Robert, and welcome to Outbreak News Interviews. Now, earlier this week, research was published in the journal Nature Microbiology, which has newly published maps that reveal, for the first time, where anthrax poses global risk to people, livestock, and wildlife. The maps are the result of 15 years of data collection covering 70 countries. So joining me today to discuss this work is the lead author, Jason Blackburn, Ph.D. Dr. Blackburn is with the Spatial Epidemiology and Ecology Research Lab, the Department of Geography at the University of Florida in Gainesville, and the Emerging Pathogens Institute at UF. Dr. Blackburn, welcome to the show, sir. Thank you very much. Happy to be here. Okay, so most people have a superficial knowledge of anthrax through the media. So can you do a short primer on the agent to start off the show? Because it's really much more than the agent of bioterrorism. Certainly. Uh, and that's absolutely true, of course, uh, particularly uh, in the aftermath of the uh, anthrax attack of 2001, uh, October of 2001, uh, also known as the Amerithrax attack. Um, uh, you know, we, we've had um, uh, social stigma and, and political stigma and concern about the disease. And of course, that, that threat is very real. Uh, but anthrax is also a disease uh, that affects uh, livestock workers and, and agriculturalists uh, nearly worldwide. Uh, the disease is caused by uh, a bacterium, uh, Bacillus anthracis, and the bacteria forms uh, a spore, uh, and that spore is essentially a metabolically inactive life cycle or life phase where that organism can survive in the environment for long periods of time, in fact, years or even decades. Then when that gets into the host, uh, most oftentimes that's a grazing animal, uh, like uh, grazing livestock or grazing or browsing wildlife. Browsers will be picking up vegetation higher off the ground. Uh, when those spores are ingested, uh, they then uh, germinate, uh, so they lose that spore and become what we call a vegetative cell. And that's a metabolically active reproducing bacterium. And it, in the process of uh, reproducing, it also releases toxins that, that uh, ultimately cause anthrax, the disease. Now, this uh, research, this work has really been a long time in the making. Um, Dr. Blackburn, can you talk about that and how this research is really, really important? for people and for wildlife. Yeah, so uh, the disease itself, uh, because of some of those stigmas that we described a moment ago, uh, it's an underreported disease. And so we know that there's more anthrax in wildlife and in humans every year around the world than what ultimately gets reported through public and veterinary health systems. And much of the data that's available worldwide is going to be uh, an aggregate value of how much anthrax happened uh, that would come through either WHO, World Health Organization, or FAO, the Food and Agricultural Organization, through their uh, aggregate uh, annotation or collection of data. So what we've uh, tried to do here is come up with a high-resolution data set, so mapping individual uh, outbreaks uh, over time or reports from the literature uh, or reports uh, published in in uh, in outbreak reports that may not be publicly available through public health institutions internationally, uh, and try to come up with a way of predicting that risk uh, to better understand where it's probably happening more than is being reported. Uh, and the goal there is to try and retool uh, surveillance, to retool uh, the education system so that in countries that have likely a higher burden than is being reported, uh, helping to point out where that risk uh, is most likely. And then we've tried to identify where the overlap of the, the pathogen, as I said, that where that spore might persist in the environment. That was the statistical model of anthrax, was to, to estimate 
that suitability for that pathogen. And then to overlay on top of that uh, human populations based on the kinds of agricultural practices they have, because we know that the most likely cause of human disease is from handling animals that have been affected. So handling livestock that were sick and, and were being slaughtered so they didn't lose the value of that animal, uh, or that they didn't know the animal was sick. Uh, and there are also cases, uh, in fact, there's been some good work recently in Tanzania showing that uh, wildlife markets uh, can also pose a similar risk, that, that handling contaminated meat from wildlife can pose a risk in humans. The other reason we were interested in looking at the wildlife livestock situation was uh, anthrax is the, the, the dominant way of controlling the disease. The most successful way of controlling the disease is good vaccination in livestock. And what we wanted to look at was where might there be areas where wildlife populations may be affected by anthrax. Those are populations we cannot reach with the livestock vaccination. So we can do two things with the wildlife. One, we can ask where are there areas of concern where uh, endangered or populations of concern might be at risk, such as the wood bison in Canada. Uh, and so understanding the conservation risk that anthrax may contribute to, but then also understanding where are there opportunities for wildlife and livestock to interact where that wildlife may be perpetuating the anthrax situation, meaning that livestock campaign, vaccination campaigns would, would really be important in those areas. So that was the goal of this study, was to really understand where might we anticipate anthrax and then which of those uh, three populations, human population, livestock, and wildlife, must be affected or need to be watched closely. So what are the some of the key things that you discovered concerning the global distribution of anthrax bacteria? So it's a, it's a great question. It's been an exciting study. Um, so some of the things that we were able to uh, take away from this study was that first and foremost in some parts of the world, uh, like parts of the former Soviet Union, where the Soviet Union had a very large uh, public health infrastructure prior to its collapse, uh, where in areas where that system has uh, continued to function uh, under new uh, independent governments, uh, we see uh, you know, a high level of vaccine distribution uh, and I just want to caveat, the vaccine data that, that are available are at the national level. So what we're hoping to do with these maps is identify where that vaccination might be best targeted to provide the greatest value to protecting livestock and, and human health. So if we look at areas, for example, of uh, South and Southeast Asia, uh, we see um, uh, that there's not good uh, synchronicity between vaccine distribution or amount of vaccine given and the population of humans at risk. So one of the things we're able to do now is sort of uh, look at the world from the perspective of where will surveillance and control provide the most immediate benefit. Um, because it's an underreported disease, we don't know exactly uh, how much goes on. And also, uh, we know that national surveillance for any country is can be burdensome. So I think what we've been able to show here is uh, a good first estimate of where to look subnationally uh, to, to better start targeting surveillance, uh, and that means getting better epidemiological data each year on potential anthrax and uh, better livestock control. Uh, and then, of course, in the wildlife areas, uh, a better uh, communication between wildlife managers uh, and uh, livestock public health personnel to better understand where those interactions might happen. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah, and I took a look at the maps and it was really fascinating to take a take a look at. And um, if we just focus on the U.S. Uh, for this question, is um, when I look at the map of the U.S., it looks like it's pretty much going from the upper Midwest down through Texas, where you you see the prevalence of anthrax um, mostly. These are like the hot spots. Did I interpret the maps correctly? That's right. So if we look at the situation in the U.S., we've seen the situation in the U.S. Uh, change uh, over the last several decades. Um, 
You're right in terms of the geographic distribution. There's really a, sort of a, a beltway from southern Texas up into uh, the Dakotas and Montana uh, with some other patches out uh, further west. Uh, what we've seen within that area over the last um, several decades is we see a, a sustained anthrax risk in the West Texas uh, where we see uh, a large uh, native deer population, our white-tailed deer population uh, there is at risk. We also, there's a, a long history of anthrax uh, in West Texas. But we've also seen uh, a growth in the wildlife ranching and farming industry, and Texas is a big part of that industry. And so we see a wildlife risk there that is a combination of both uh, farmed wildlife and free-ranging wildlife. When we get up into the Dakotas, uh, parts of western Minnesota uh, and eastern Montana, these are areas that deal with livestock anthrax, uh, fairly regularly. Um, and of course, those state veterinarians in that region uh, have a very good handle on that and work closely with their uh, farmers and stakeholders at, at livestock vaccination programs. Um, so those are sort of the two hot spots uh, that are inside of that uh, predicted area. And one of the things that my lab has been doing is working and partnering with state veterinarians, uh, livestock veterinarians throughout those states and state wildlife veterinarians to try and improve our own surveillance inside of that predicted zone to try and better understand are there wildlife events that aren't being reported or documented uh, or are there livestock wildlife uh, outbreaks that that might happen uh, so you're right in the in the description of the hot spots and and that distribution and then that carries on up into uh, sort of central western Canada up into the uh, Northwest Territory where the wood bison problem exists. Is that because of the climate of that area or and the, and the terrain or both or is there a reason for that? It is. So uh, this uh, anthrax is, is sort of classically described as a, as a grassland disease. Uh, and so uh, many of the areas that we've identified uh, in this study uh, are, can broadly be defined as part of uh, one of the grassland uh, ecosystems, and so of course that goes up through the uh, the the great prairies of historically the great prairies of the u s and up into canada yeah. so what's what's next uh, any follow up uh, to this work so I think there are are really uh, three main follow ups uh, the first is we've done a, a number of smaller studies uh, like this in fact in the in the in the development of this large uh, database that you identified. We've been working with international partners for uh, the last 15 years to compile these data sets and model anthrax risk at the national or subnational level for smaller pieces of the, of the globe. And one of the things that we've been able to do at local levels, such as modeling just the U.S. or just Italy, uh, we've been able to do some uh, genetically informed modeling. Uh, so Bacillus anthracis, the bacteria that we've been talking about, um, has uh, five major lineages uh, of the bacteria, and those are not distributed equally geographically when we when we look around the world. And so one of the things we'd like to do is work with uh, our own collection of bacteria and with genetic data that's available through other laboratories or through public databases and refine these models to better understand the geographic distribution of those individual lineages because we think that'll give us a better understanding of those those risk areas that we defined. We think we can better define them when we take into account the genetics. Uh, the other two things we'd like to work on is we'd like to work with our international partners to really better understand human case reporting in those areas of high risk that we identify uh, so we can better understand are the surveillance strategies and public health outreach. And by that I mean uh, making sure local agricultural communities are aware of the risks and signs of anthrax, both in, in animals and in humans. Making sure that the diagnostic laboratories that support that reporting have the technology and capability to easily identify uh, and confirm anthrax. Uh, and then making sure that the case data 
are becoming available at a resolution that can, can help refine those maps because we think as we refine those maps, we'll get better local control. And then the third piece uh, that's next is really trying to work with those international partners to put the same priority on mapping the distribution of vaccine usage for livestock at the same resolution that we were able to map outbreaks. So where is the vaccine going out? It's a seasonal vaccine. It has to be administered every year ahead of whatever that local anthrax season is. Uh, so in the months leading up to the to the anthrax period in a given location, where is the vaccine being administered? Out of the number of doses that you had available, how many were used? And really get a better understanding on making sure that the livestock vaccine is being administered effectively and being administered in the right places. And then also vaccination campaigns have to be sustained uh, for two reasons. One, the vaccine is short-lived in a given animal. So if you vaccinate a cow this spring for the 2019 anthrax season, you'll have to vaccinate that cow again in the spring of 2020. So that vaccine has to be uh, administered annually. And so making sure those campaigns are sustained uh, in those high risk areas. So I think those are the, the next three steps for, for our research in this area. Well, that's some fascinating stuff. And uh, for the audience, I'll link to the paper on the website when I uh, publish the podcast in the show notes section. And I want to thank you, Dr. Jason Blackburn, for sharing your research today. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. I appreciate it.